All right. Hello, everybody. Hi, my name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program, Hell from the Heavens. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask the audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. I did also want to make a note that I will be dimming these front lights um, so that the screen is a little bit easier to see before the pr presentation starts. But if anybody is still having trouble, just come back and let me know and I can fix that. We'd also like to thank the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library and their many fundraising efforts. It's thanks to their support that we can provide wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Our next program is Chautauqua Movement, its origins, national significance, and presence in Michigan, which will be an in-person event on Tuesday, March 7th at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. And now, without further ado, please welcome our presenter, John Wilkovitz. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Amelia. I'm Amalia, excuse me. <laughs> I'm not used to speaking with a microphone as much, but with, as she said, they're taping the program, and which, which makes me happy because I was sort of just getting a little tired of America's Most Wanted rerunning my episode all the time. So better this than that, right? <laughs> anyway, I'm John Wilkovitz. Uh, I'll be talking, as she said, about that book. Ah, there we go, yeah. Uh, Hell from the Heavens, about the ship that's there, and I'll get to in a second. <clears throat> First, a little background about myself. I'm a local boy. I, um, well, I was born in Akron, Ohio, and then Firestone transferred us up to Michigan when I was going into junior high. I attended Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit because for a while I was thinking of being a Catholic priest. And then I stopped that thought in my senior year of high school and attended University of Notre Dame. Uh, after that, I got, I, I got a doctor, uh, excuse me, bachelor's degree in history from Notre Dame and a master's in American history from Michigan State. <clears throat> excuse me. Once I was done, I, I got into teaching. And I had a 30-year career of teaching language arts and history in Trenton. And there you see a picture of me in my first year of teaching, 1968. I mean, if you were around for the styles in those days, the fashions, the knot that almost choked you, long sideburns. My daughter said, oh, Dad, you did have hair once upon a time ago. Love those glasses, right? Well, not long after this picture, a movie came out. And I don't know about you, <laughs> any connection there? I wonder if they stole my you know, name, image, likeness and put it in that poster uh, as a revenge of the nerds. Anyway, I really loved teaching. <clears throat> I was big in my classroom on telling the students, go for your dream, follow your dream. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. Work hard, that kind of thing. I always show, you know, the movie Rudy. I'm a Notre Dame, you know, die hard for sure. Uh, but the obstacles he overcame, that was one of my favorite posters. Great visions often start with small dreams kind of a thing. <clears throat> and one day, as I was telling the kids that, I thought to myself, you know, Wokovitz, you're telling them to follow your dream and you th sort of thought you wanted to write, but you've never taken that first step? What if one of the students asked, what's your dream, Mr. Wokovitz? <laughs> you know, I'd have to say, well, you are obviously my students. But I, I thought that day, all right, if I'm telling them to go follow their dream, maybe I ought to do the same. And that's when I got into writing. I was teaching at the same time. My two careers, <clears throat> excuse me, teaching and writing overlapped. My first article was in the Wyandotte News Herald, 1983. 
It was just a thing about that guy. They named the library after him, and I wanted to find out who Bacon was. Uh, he was a fascinating politician in the House of Representatives, actually. But to see my name in print, as the arrow is pointing to, and spelled correctly, I might add, just because Wolkovitz can get mangled, um, it was quite a thrill. Um, and so I enjoyed that. That led on to the books that I've written, and uh, you see mo many of them against the wall over there. So after the presentation, if any of you are interested in purchasing an inscribed copy, I'll be happy to uh, do so. Uh, I'm going to sign those for you. <clears throat> now, they're all about World War II, as I, as I was telling a couple before the presentation. When I was in fourth grade, I read a book about the Battle of the Coral Sea for kids, and I was hooked. I wanted to read more about World War II. I mean, I love everything about history. I, working at Firestone Plant in summers between my college years, I would m memorize lists of presidents and kings of England and all that nerdy stuff. I was a history nerd from way, way back, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, <laughs> I might add. I've done some television work. Uh, uh, those are three of them right here. Um, the next book that's coming out May 16th is on, he, he's a main character, Eddie Rickenbacker. Some of you may know him. He was a famous World War I aviator, the, the number one flying ace for the United States. Before that, he was a champion auto racer in the days when, not that the sport isn't dangerous today, but in those days, on dirt tracks, the rocks kicked up at him and all kinds of stuff. And he survived numerous crashes throughout his life. Well, in 1942, the United States government asked Eddie Rickenbacker to fly across the Pacific, as the war started in December of 41 with Pearl Harbor, to fly across the Pacific and deliver a message to General Douglas MacArthur. The government wanted to tell MacArthur, quit criticizing your superior officers and quit trying to run for president. <laughs> that was what Franklin Roosevelt wanted that message across. So they said, who would deliver a message to a, such a figure as Douglas MacArthur? Another popular figure. And so they asked Eddie Rickenbacker to do that. Well, halfway across the Pacific, the plane he and seven others were in ran out of fuel, got lost, they had to ditch, uh, right about on the equator, just a little below it. And they spent 24 days adrift on the Pacific, apparently lost. Uh, the search crews couldn't find him. Well, miraculously, it ended up they obviously were found, except for one <clears throat> who didn't survive. But it's that story, and here you have some pictures of it. Now, it's already gotten from Publishers Weekly, readers will be gripped. So if you want to be gripped, get that book when it comes out. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, at least they liked it, so that's one person that likes it. Uh, now, <clears throat> A couple things have happened to me in addition to the writing, but they're a result of my writing. In my field, the Rear Admiral Samuel Elliott Morrison Award is, is given once a year. Morrison was a famous naval historian, so they named this award after him. In my book, Tin Can Titans won it a couple years back. It's, in my field, it's the same as getting an Oscar except for the money, fame, and glory. Yeah, mind you, <laughs> there's none of that, none of that. <laughs> no groupies are involved in any way, nothing, no money. But anyway, in my field, it's really cool because my writing mentor, Tom Buell, his, was his name. He won that award as well, so I was quite proud. <clears throat> there I am receiving it, and there's some of my family and Terry's right there uh, in New York City. The other thing is the, the film, based on the book I'll talk about tonight, and I'll get into that a little more later in detail, uh, but, but that is uh, forthcoming uh, one of these days, and I'll mention that in a bit. Now, if you re read any of the books I've written, you'll see that I try to tell the story through the experiences of the people who were there. 
some historians like to say, Company A did this and Company B did that. I like to say Charles Natter did this and Frederick Beckton did that. If you think of the movies or TV shows or books that you like, I'll bet it's because you like one of the characters in it or you're drawn to a character, character driven. You don't have to like him even. Hannibal Lecter, the movie Silence of the Lambs fascinated me. His character, Hannibal Lecter, fascinated me, but I didn't like him, <laughs> not at all if you saw the movie. But a character draws you in. And so that's what I try to do. And as this screen shows, I use a lot of letters and uh, things to convey all of those emotions, personal interviews, etc. So tonight, I'm not going to tell you about the whole crew aboard Laffey, you know, 300 plus individuals. I'll tell you about three. The book will t focus on a small number as well, um, <clears throat> although most of them are mentioned somewhere. Now, the beginnings. The ship's captain, Becton, learned his command skills from a couple of different places not just the Naval Academy, but he would read, and he was particularly taken by the Civil War General Schofield, and what Schofield said, treat the men under them with respect. Their differences are far less than they generally seem. An officer is supposed to worry about his men first, Becton always said, then think about himself. MacArthur would be an example of the opposite. Great general, I have nothing again, I love reading about him, and he was a genius, no doubt about it. He handled it differently. Patton, love reading about him, he was not as interested in the men as he was in results. Well, Becton, the other way, think about them. Now, Becton also had another thought on his mind during the book, or during the experiences in the Pacific, his girlfriend, Imogene here. She was a Broadway performer, then moved out to Hollywood, and they grew up in the same Arkansas town. So when they reunited in New York City, they started dating, and he, they kept dating throughout the war. And he noticed, that he'd go to some of her rehearsals for the plays that she was in, and he noticed, as he says here, the drills had to be endlessly practiced, you know, so that when they performed, they knew what they were doing. Theater rehearsals and Navy exercises both require discipline, dedication, concentration. So he was real big on training the men, training the men, training the men, training the men, okay? <clears throat> Ari Futridis, on the other hand, was a yeoman. He was on the bridge near Becton, and he was trying to size this new commander up. Is he any good? I know he's got a good-looking girlfriend because I love it when he tells me to go to his room below decks and get something. I get to look at her picture, he told me. Uh, Ari was a real character. But he said to his sister, or wrote, G. Spa, he's one of the finest men I've met in a long time. But how will he handle himself in combat? You know, he's a nice guy here. What about combat? He didn't have to wait long. Normandy, D-Day, June 6, 1944. A little later that month, Laffey, there's a ship pictured there, a destroyer, took on Battery Hamburg on land, a very powerful group of artillery. German shells were splashing all over, and Futridius was on the bridge thinking, let's get out of here. Instead, Becton was moving the opposite way. He, he turned the ship to go toward shore. And Fertritus is thinking, I don't want to go there. Let's go the other way. Well, the next German salvo, that's a group of shells that hit, <clears throat> excuse me, hit right where the ship would have been where I wanted going out to sea. So if, if he had done what I wanted, we would have been hit. So Becton outthought him. Well, they're going to fire the next salvo there. I'm going to turn around and head the other way. That was the moment I had full confidence in my skipper. <clears throat> the third man, Tom Fern here, he came from a military family. And as you see here, 
Corporal Patrick Fern in the Civil War, Henry Fern, World War I, recipients of medals. He said, I don't want to let them down. I got a family tradition here. Will I be up to the task? He did not want to dishonor his family. <clears throat> All right, now out to the Pacific. After, you know, Normandy is in France, obviously, so then they had a little delay as they were moving across the Atlantic and then over to the Pacific. And suddenly they reach the Pacific and Beckton starts ramping up these anti-aircraft drills. You know, the guns on a ship that fire against anti-aircraft, try to shoot them down as they're approaching. <clears throat> And some of them wondered, this guy named Robert Johnson told me, Beckton focused on this almost every day. Well, when we got to the Philippines, we found out why he did that. And he warned them, he said, the Japanese are desperate, and for us the worst is coming. We were up against something entirely new, kamikazes. One plane hitting into a ship. They were in the Philippines for these three operations, Ormoc landings. I don't know if, if the laser shows up too well for you, but then Mindoro and Lingay and Gulf. They were in those three. The first one at Ormac, now that's an actual picture of Laffey under fire. Kamikaze for anti-aircraft, that's the anti-aircraft burst there. For nine hours, they swooped down on the formation like hornets whose nests we had invaded. And this isn't even the big attack that we'll get to in a minute. This is a preliminary, an hors d'oeuvre if you want to put it that way. <clears throat> so here's a kamikaze. That is not Laffey in this picture. It's a generic photo, but that's the purpose of them. The real thing about that attack at Ormac was the aftermath when Laffey pulled back into port in the Philippines. They saw another destroyer, same size as Laffey, that had been hit by a kamikaze, USS Hughes and they were stunned. As Laffey steamed by the stricken Hughes, the men were mentally thinking, my God, that gun mount right there that's gone? That's my gun mount on Laffey. That station over there that's charred and ruined, that's my station. All these thoughts going through their mind, you know. Normandy was their initiation into battle, but here, battle is personalized. Because they put themselves mentally on that Hughes. Now the war becomes more personal. You know, and that's when the interesting part begins. <clears throat> Tom Fern, the guy who did not want to dishonor his family, wrote home right after it, I still can stand on my two feet, but what I've seen in the past week, all those kamikazes, makes a fellow wonder, am I next? I've never felt the need for prayers as much as I have in the past weeks. His aunt was a nun, a Catholic nun, and she had given him a medal, and he made sure that was always with him, for sure, after he had seen that damage. Now, Okinawa, April of 1945. <clears throat> the Americans wanted to seize Okinawa to use it as a base from which they would mount the expected invasion of the Japanese home islands, which are right here, not far away. Attacking Okinawa, though, to the Japanese was almost the same as attacking Japan proper because they called it, Okinawa was a prefecture. It's only 350 miles south. That's about from here to Chicago. I don't know, it's a rough estimate, but it's gotta be about 325 miles, somewhere around there. And so they're gonna fight for it. You come fighting for a person a thousand miles from their homeland is one thing. You fight for them a few miles away is a different thing. The Japanese had to come up with a new plan. This late in the war, 1945, they were short of everything, materials, aircraft, ships, you name it. The United States, they lose an aircraft carrier, they build some more. Factors just were cranking things out like mad. 
you know, if you read about the production during wartime, it was unreal. Japanese didn't have that capacity. So they thought, okay, we're short on aircraft, we're short on skilled pilots even. So one aircraft attacks one ship. That's the kamikaze. We lose a plane, we lose a pilot, maybe they lose a ship. You know, at least suffer some severe damage. So when the Americans came and uh, assaulted Okinawa, they commenced an operation of 10 huge airstrikes against the American ships. Now the American ships were stationed around Okinawa. Those yellow dots, are, I just put them there just to have a circular formation. And I didn't even put 16. There were 16, they're called radar picket stations. Destroyers would steam there, and when they saw a Japanese force of planes coming, they would alert the forces closer to Okinawa. Hey, here they come. That was their job. Picket stations. They were off Okinawa from between 15 and 75 miles off. Nobody, <clears throat> nobody wanted to go to that picket station number one. That one was the closest to Japan, which is not on this map, but it's right there. And it always got hit worse because kamikaze pilots were scared too. That's, I include the, a, a part in the book on kamikaze pilots and what they were thinking. Um, you know, they, all right, I'm gonna hit, attack the first thing I find. And maybe I won't hit it, I'll just drop a bomb kind of thing. So these ships always got lambasted. Nobody wanted to go there. Well, Lieutenant Runk, the Laffey's communications officer, went up to Captain Becton and said, oh, I have a message I don't think you want. And Becton knew we're going to picket station number one. And he later wrote, the gates of hell awaited us. The crews didn't like it either. They had already called picket station number one, Purple Heart Corner, you know, Purple Heart, some of the veterans in the crowd obviously know what that is. So most of the rest of you probably do too if you're wounded in battle. Purple Heart Corner and bogey is a word meaning enemy aircraft, Boulevard. One man said, great, we got that order on Friday the 13th. What luck. And then another man pointed out, look at our ship's number, 724. Add those up, 13. <laughs> I mean, and Ari Futridis, I spent a lot of time with him, and he said, John, you have to understand what it was like in World War II. A lot of crews were very superstitious. This was a real fear we had. Now, maybe not so much. You know, I'm just a civilian, retired, blah, blah, blah. He was, he was living out west. But he said, sailors are a superstitious lot, and we thought something was going to happen to us. Becton. Remember the guy who said, think of your men? He saw that. He flashed a message. Becton had a message sent to a nearby, an LST is a transport that brings in troops or tanks or whatever equipment, and they also take mail around to different ships. He said, hey, do you have any mail for Laffey aboard? They did, but they responded, you're going to have to wait your turn. There are other ships in line ahead of you. When Becton was back in Boston with a ship before heading out to the Pacific, he had an ice cream maker put into his ship. Just thought it'd be nice for the crew. So he, he flashed the message, five gallons ice cream for immediate delivery of any mail for Laffey. Yep, send boat, they said right away. So they got their mail because he had arranged, you know, he didn't know this would happen, but the foresight, the forethought uh, of Becton. So they got their mail. That may seem like a little thing, but again, our friend uh, uh, Ari Futridis said, you gotta understand this. We had been in underway for seven weeks without getting any mail. You know, today we can text, we can email, we can whatever. World War II, huh? Mail. <clears throat> and the crew was pretty much down in the dumps. And many of us thought, this may be our last action. We're gonna get hit. And boy, would a letter help. Well, they got their letters. 
and I hope to God none was a Dear John letter. <laughs> I didn't find one that was, but uh, you'll hope not. Now the attack, April 16th, 1945. Now there at picket station number one, there is one destroyer, Laffey, and two other ships, here's one of them, steaming with them, very lightly armed. They were just there to make them feel more comfortable. They have some company. The crews call those ships pallbearers, because their job is gonna take the bodies back that are killed in the attack. So Laffey was sort of on her own. Now there is a, a, a combat air patrol, CAP, combat air patrol. There were two planes, two fighters flying at lower altitudes, searching for any Japanese, and two four plane fighters, eight planes, operating farther out and higher up. And if they said, hey, here come the Japanese, they'd alert Laffey and Laffey would try and prepare for it. <clears throat> Well, on April 16th at 7.30 a.m., Beckton lost communications with those two planes flying down low. Just cut out. Loss of power. Who would ever think that would ever happen, right? No one lost power up here this, this past week <laughs> in the ice storm kind of a thing. Well, they, they, he just lost communications there with them. Reminder to self, scratch that joke. <laughs> the, um, anyway... <laughs> Then, 25 minutes later, four aircraft approached at a higher altitude, 17 miles away, and those eight aircraft at higher altitude went off in pursuit. Now Laffey's on its own, no air cover, none. Still unable to contact the two-plane cap. <clears throat> well, at 8.20, so 7.55 to 8.20, 25 minutes later, here come the Japanese. Radar man in the Combat Information Center reported a large formation. Each dot is an enemy aircraft. Becton said that screen had so many dots, it looked like it had chicken pox. That many aircraft, what are we gonna do? 165 of them raced toward Okinawa. Now many veered away to attack other ships. 22, though, settled on Laffey, the first vessel they spotted. Then the fireworks started, wrote Becton. <clears throat> now, Becton's plan, if he could do this, was to make the enemy kamikazes come in on his beam, on his side, like those two arrows point. Here's Laffey. Because if the enemy aircraft came in on his side, all the guns on that side could fire at him. Plus, the Japanese pilot only had the width of the ship to hit before he overflew it. He's just, you know, just this little thing here. And boom, he's over. So that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to avoid attacks from ahead or behind. Because there the Japanese pilot would have the whole length of the ship and very few guns could fire at it. So it's a maneuvering process. Now, that's nice if they fly the way you want them to, but here come the time. This one will show all 22. Boom, there they are. Try and maneuver that in 80 minutes, huh? That was Becton's issue. How do you handle it? How do you do that? Now, the first eight they handled quite well. The Japanese tried to box in Becton. As you see, they're coming from all quarters. None of them got there. They were all splashed by anti-aircraft fire from the Laffey. But they did damage part of his radar. The SG radar locates low-flying aircraft. Nine through 12, three minutes, they hammered mainly the rear section here. In three harrowing minutes, they converged on the destroyer. They inflicted most of the damage aft all of them strafing as they come in, strafing as they're shooting their machine guns as they come in. Tom Fern, with his medal that the, the aunt uh, gave him, the nun, he was firing away at his aircraft gun station. This is not a picture of Tom Fern. It's a generic World War II, same ship as Laffey, okay? 
Look at how open they are. Planes coming in at you to hit you. They're shooting at you. All they have for protection, really nothing. All in the open. Talk about personalizing an attack, huh? <clears throat> the kamikazes that hit, this is the damage that they did. You see the aft part, this is Laffy here in a drawing, and the aft part of fire. Spread gasoline that engulfed men and equipment, each hit. The flames here cooked off ammunition. You know, there's ammunition lying near the guns and below decks. It's cooking those off, more explosions on top of the initial explosion. Flames and gasoline poured through the deck, holes in the deck below, threatening all of the store of explosives. And if that goes, the ship is certainly gone. So what's Tom Fern and his buddies do? They start throwing some of the unused ammunition overboard. Disregarding their personal safety and pain from blistered and badly burned hands. So shells were hot. The fires were near and they had to get them overboard. <clears throat> Kamikaze 12, as far as Becton was concerned, the captain, they damaged his steering ability. Stuck, the rudder was stuck. He couldn't turn the ship. It kept going in circles now. How do you maneuver? He can only go in circles. Well, he figured out a plan that sort of helped. He wanted to go as fast as he could, but the faster he went, the more wind went into the flames on the back part of the ship and fanned the flames. So he should go slow to help them out. Go slow, Japanese pilots have a better target. So he did what he could, but he was sort of cornered in many ways. And when an attack started, <clears throat> You know, he would speed up the ship when there was a lull, as there were here and there, five minutes here, eight minutes there, then he would uh, go faster. <clears throat> 920 was the one that really hammered him in different parts, ravaged the ship. Barely missed Becton and Futritas, because they were both on the bridge. Sliced off the port yard arm, the flag, went fluttering to the deck. Number 17 through 19, they shot down. But after the 19th, Lieutenant Manson, <clears throat> communications officer, came up and said to Becton, you think we ought to abandon ship here? We're in pretty bad shape. And Becton, I have pictures of American naval heroes, you know, damn the poor torpedoes, full speed ahead, kind of quotes. He said, we still have guns that can shoot. I'll never abandon ship as long as a gun will fire. Now, that's a pretty neat quote there right in the middle of the attack. Not gonna, nope, nope, if we have a gun, we're fighting. One gun, we fight. The final three came in there, and they were highlighted by <clears throat> a man named, uh, where is he, I have, there is Jack Andrusek. He was not even, his station was not on one of those guns, but the two guys that were there were killed and a kamikaze was coming at him, so he ran over and took over. He and another guy, fellow Teagle. And they kept firing, and this kamikaze dropped a bomb. The bomb was coming at the ship. Looked like pretty much right at them. And Andrusek was firing, and another guy who was right next to him said, John, I could see the bullets pinging off that bomb. But to explode it, you gotta hit it right on the spot. And he didn't. And they fired until the final moment when the bomb, the gun, and those two guys died in a mammoth explosion. Talk about guts, huh? Staying at your station. That's the military. A number of you here were, maybe are, in the military. Anyway, I always admired that. Suddenly, it was over. The strangest sensation, John, came across us. Silence. Silence. We wondered why. After 80 minutes of noise, there was quiet. Futridis looked up and saw 24 American fighters coming to help him. And the other Japanese took off. 
So the battle was over. <clears throat> Here's what they did in the 80 minute span. They shot down nine kamikazes. Six kamikazes smashed into the ship and another grazed. Mount 53 is one of the big gun mounts. Okay. Another five landed bomb hits. 32 men died, 72 wounded, one third of the crew that Beckton brought with him to the Pacific. So he lost one third of the crew that day. <clears throat> Tom Fern was badly injured from the fires, mainly uh, from throwing the shells overboard. And he wrote his aunt a few lines, I'm okay. I'm getting over the effects of concussion from an explosion. He thanked her for the medal. I had the medal in my pocket when death came my way three times that I can remember that day. He kept that medal with him. He underplayed his contribution. A friend of his, Ramon Pressburger, wrote letters for Tom Fern, like the one I just read, because his hands were so heavily bandaged from the, the burns. He couldn't write. Ramon did, and he added his own note to Fern, Fern's, Fern's family. While we were talking about Tom, Ramon wrote, that's him there, I want to tell you, boy, you have a boy to be proud of. I can't tell you how much, but like we say, he has a lot of guts. I want to live up to my family heritage. I don't want to let my family down. He didn't. Tom Fern certainly didn't. Well, the ship, here it is after the attack. You can see the mangled bed. They did fix it up enough to steam back to Pearl Harbor, escorted by just a troop ship is all. Dashing Wave, it was called. And when they got near Pearl Harbor, Dashing Wave said it was an honor to be escorted by you to the Laffey, even though it couldn't really protect it as most of their guns were destroyed. <clears throat> they got to Pearl Harbor, and news of the attack had preceded them. As they steamed into Pearl Harbor, on the decks of the ships already in that harbor, <clears throat> the sailors were standing at attention, saluting Laffey and the crew for what they did. For treat us. Most of us have tears in our eyes. I have a tough time talking about it, actually. Um, but that's how much they honored those guys. Some of them liked what came afterwards. A little bit more, though, an admiral threw them a big beer and hot dog party. <laughs> nice job, guys. Have all the beer and hot dogs you want. Doesn't sound like much to the men in Pacific in World War II. That was grand, <laughs> you know, so, so they, they appreciated that. Then they made their way home. Here it is pulling into Seattle after 39 days after the hell of Radar Picket Station number one. They came to great praise from the press. Those quotes there, a heart that couldn't be broken kind of a thing, huh? Big ads, that's from Life Magazine picturing the Laffey to raise war bonds. Even a comic book did a story on the Laffey crew, calling it Laffey's two hours of heroism and agony is one of the greatest sea epics of the war. <clears throat> Tom Fern, here he is, receiving his medal. The whole crew was issued a presidential unit citation. That's an award given to the whole group. Good job guys, all of you. So you each are participants in that. 28 men received individual awards, Becton a Navy Cross, that's the second highest award after the Medal of Honor, and Tom Fern a Silver Star. And there he is getting it there. Love of Laffey in the aftermath of all this. <clears throat> Becton went on to a wonderful career in the Navy becoming an admiral. After he retired in 1992, I think it was, yeah, a reporter interviewed him about his Navy career and he was, Becton showed him around all the memorabilia that he had and he said, the one over there with all the names, 
They're my crew on the Laffey. That one I treasure most of all. Eric Futritas, the one who said, does he measure up? I like him, he wrote his sister. I really like him, but how will we do in battle? Eric Futritas, above all, loved his dad. Now, a lot of us do, but he did. His dad was a, a minister, and Eric had great respect for him. He measured every male against how he stacked up with dad. Eric Futritas in his home in Portland, Oregon, two photographs rested on a table in his room. One of Dad, one of Beckton. <laughs> Amazing. Now those guys protected a ship. They protected each other, but also a ship. And they didn't want to see it just sold for scrap. My God, we you know, 80 minutes of us fighting, we, we can't, we can't. So at a reunion, they talked about that. We didn't want the breakers, the waves, and the guys who will crash, uh, break up the ship to do what the Japanese had never been able to. So uh, in 1981, they arranged with a place in South Carolina, and maybe some of you have been to Patriots Point. It uh, is a floating museum. I walk the decks of Laffey with Ari Futritas pointing out everything about the battle to me uh, along the way. They accepted it. It's, it's right next, this is Laffey today, and that's the USS Yorktown, a World War II aircraft carrier. There's also a submarine that's not pictured there. Every year, including now, as a matter of fact, you know, this April, they'll be their next work party. The guys on the ship, now the ship lasted into the Vietnam War. You know, there aren't, as far as I know, there are no more World War II veterans. There may be one. Uh, but that's it. But the others have taken over. They come in to clean it up, make it look good, because people walk through there as spectators. It's a museum, and we want our ship looking good. And I was with them for one. They also drank their fair share of beer. <laughs> no doubt about that, which makes our stories even better. <laughs> Those are the ones you can't use in the book, though. Um, <clears throat> Now here the, the two ships are. Beckton said, this ship is alive with memories of brave deeds and brave men, and we can't let them be forgotten. Hopefully, the people will be inspired. Now here's Ari Fertritas on the deck of the Laffey. That's Yorktown right there. When he showed me around, there were people who had come there just as spectators to look at the ship. And then he overheard Ari talk about the battle. And you could see him whispering, that guy's a veteran of the attack. So they started forming around him. And there's only a few in this picture, but it was actually more than that, maybe 10 people at one time. And they just asked him for a half hour questions about the battle. And you can see the pride in Ares' eyes as he was doing that. They think I'm something special. He doesn't, I can guarantee that, but they do. <clears throat> Tom Fern was always in the work parties until he passed away. Because we want that to be a legacy we can pass down to our children. I don't ever want to forget what it involved. Now when the book came out, Hell from the Heavens, I called Marguerite Fern. <clears throat> That's her sitting there, Tom's widow. He had passed away. And I called her to say, I'm sending you an inscribed copy, Marguerite. And she thanked me, and then she said, do you think I'm crazy? And I, I didn't really know how to respond. I said, what do you mean, Marguerite? What do you mean? Well, in the last few years, since you've been writing the book, I've told everyone I know, my family and friends and all, that when the book comes in, each day I'm going to get a folding chair and go to the cemetery. I'm going to sit there at Tom's grave, and I'm going to read it to him. And I, I said, Marguerite, crazy. That's the, what kind of expression of love gets better than that, huh? And she did. She did that. She read the book to her husband. Okay, now on a little bit of a lighter note, <laughs> we'll switch from cemetery to film. <clears throat> A little bit about that, and then there's a lesson at the end, and that'll take care of it. I'll take questions.
you know. Uh, anyway, uh, it is being made into a film, and it started in 2016. It was the first note. Jim Hornfisher. Anyone know that name? He's written. He did write some beautiful books on World War II. He's like me, but he was also a literary agent and a lawyer. He was my literary agent, good friend. He sent me an email, you know, I'm in touch with some filmmakers who want to make your Laffy book into a movie, more to come. And I said, oh, okay, all right. I, re I replied to him, you're kidding. Is this something that might really happen? <laughs> Be still my heart. I was a little excited that day. <laughs> Be still my heart, <laughs> me. And he replied, well, yeah, some pretty credible people seem to want to try their company has set up on Warner Brothers' lot. Well, the company was and is Hollywood Gang Productions. Those are pictures of some of the films they've been involved in. And that's the boss, Gianni Nanari. Very respectable production company. And the assistant producer, I was talking to her on phone once, and, and I thought, you know, how did you pick my book? because there's a lot of World War II books out there. I said, I'm not complaining, but I want, well, what made you choose it? She said, well, John, we were just in the process of looking for military stories. And I was visiting my dad and told that to my dad, and he said, well, here, I'm reading this book. It's great for a movie. And it was the, the book, Alfred Evans. <laughs> so somewhere out there is a dad who I owe a nice gift to. Uh, but that's how it came about, just luck. <laughs> luck entirely. Now the producer hires a director and that's Mel Gibson and most of you are familiar with him and uh, it was exciting to get that news. Uh, the director that he did those movies, he, he can make Oscar winning movies that make a ton of money for sure. And those are just three of them there. <clears throat> then once you get the director you need a screenwriter. They first hired Taylor Sheridan. I don't know if that name's familiar to you. Yeah, he's all over TV, isn't he? Uh, Hell, from the, Hell or High Water is a good mo excuse me, movie. But the, the Yellowstone, 1881, is it? 1882, 1883? I was getting there sooner or later. 1923, he's done all that. And I thought, wow. Well, then suddenly he was not part of the project, and I don't know why. They hired Rosalind Ross. <clears throat> I'm not, I have no idea what happened. Uh, but he wasn't uh, too bad. But she did a nice job, too, in writing the screenplay. <laughs> the, now, normally, when an author signs away the rights to a book to filmmakers, the author's role is done. Elmore Leonard used to live not far from here. A lot of his books have been turned into a movie or TV series. Justified is one of my all-time favorites. He said that, he said, once I sign the rights, I turn my back and walk away. And that's what I expected. Well, Roslyn sent me 50, 60 emails asking specific questions, and there's one of them there. You know, how was this in the Navy? What did they do in this case? Uh, how, you know, what would they say if? Did they say turn right or what? And if you're in the Navy, you know turn right is hardly what they would say, but, but those are the kind of questions she didn't know. And so I was thrilled to be a part of those 50 or 60 emails. One email was she and Gibson asking me to go see the movie Dunkirk and then send my opinion. So I did. I did not like it at all, which goes against, I think most people liked it, but I didn't. And I sent, this is, I probably sent a nine paragraph email outlining everything I didn't like about it. Before I hit the send button, I thought, what if Gibson loves this movie? <laughs> I'm screwed, <laughs> you know, that kind of a thing. But I sent it. Well, Rosalind Ross said, I couldn't agree more on your points. Mel turned to me 20 minutes in the movie and said, do you care about any of these people? They didn't. They want character driven. And I agreed with that. That's one of the points I made. I didn't care about any of the people in the movie. Um, I didn't think it was done too well, but anyway, I got some brownie points for that email, I suppose. <laughs> now, after the screenwriter, you need an actor to anchor it, and that's Mark Wahlberg. 
um, has agreed to play in it as Becton. The other roles, I don't know if they're cast yet, but th those two have a friendship of sorts, uh, so he has agreed to, uh, to play in it. Now, in, one time Gibson called because he wanted to know the maneuvering that Becton did during the battle, which I just explained here. And so we talked for 45 minutes or so. It was, it was really cool to have that, and he ended it with, you know, so now I want you to fly out to my home here in Malibu so we can go over the screenplay together. And I want you to point out any mistakes we made. So I said, yeah, because <laughs> he's paying for it, so what the heck, huh? Um, my daughters told me, Dad, you got to take two pictures anyway. One of Mel Gibson with you. And get one of the guy who picks you up at the airport <laughs> with a name they want to see. And it's in magic marker, I see. <laughs> Elegant in himself. <laughs> but they spelled it right. But I had told them, you know, I'm going out there not as a fan or anything like that. It's, I'm there as a military historian. I have a job to do. And I'm not going to pester him. And I didn't. I was uh, really good at that. Well, he drove me up to his house. And this is from a magazine layout. Uh, of his outside, sort of looks like Braveheart could come charging out, doesn't it? You know, or King Henry VIII or something like that. It was a nice house. This is the table we worked again, Henry VIII up there or something like that. Um, he sat here in this chair, and I was over right there next to other editors, uh, screenwriter, uh, that kind of thing, just talking about the screenplay. 111 pages, and again, I was to point out mistakes, and they made a couple of little ones, which I doubt general viewers would ever catch. They did include one scene, fictional, that um, I didn't think should be in there, and I said that, and I was mindful as I said that, that not far behind Mel Gibson, there was a medieval battle axe leaning in the corner. And he's Braveheart, and I'm going to tell him, I don't like this scene. <laughs> you know? I thought, are you sure you want to do this, John? Um, but I did, and I lost. <laughs> you know, he said, well, I sort of like it. But after the meeting, the guy who does this storyboard, it's like a comic book. And, and this guy, Dan, would not want it to be called a comic book version of the movie. But they lay it all out. When I taught language arts, I'd have the kids do that for stories. Lay out little pieces of paper with what you're going to do in each section. He came up to me and he said, you know, John, I've been working with Gibson for 20 years. And I know how he operates. He said, I don't like that scene either. And by the time we're going to go film, it won't be in the screenplay. <laughs> so I was glad to hear that. <laughs> now, Gibson made Hacksaw Ridge, and maybe you saw a wonderful movie about Desmond Doss, uh, a conscientious objector, a wonderful movie, for 27 million. This is where he filmed it, the whole movie, right there. If you remember the scenes along the cliff, there it is. Here are all the equipment vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, here's a cliff down here too. He wants over a hundred million for this movie. And he had it too. He had it all assembled. He had over a hundred million assembled. Because he wants to film it in Australia and a, more than a thousand, I call them special effects scenes, but the, the editor in charge, they said, no, we call it visual effects. <laughs> so I said, all right, sorry, I didn't know. Um, but anyway, um, Gibson had assembled all the money from a group of Chinese financiers. Actually, the producer assembles the money, Jani Nanari. But remember the Chinese tariff war, I'll call it, of a few years back? Well, China stopped the flow of money leaving China, and so they have to renegotiate a different deal. And then COVID hit, and Australia was very tight on letting anything, so that shut it down for a couple of years, of course. Anyway, a thousand special effects. Now, the other picture that I took, <laughs> Uh, was that one uh, with Gibson in his backyard. When I asked him the last day, I said, you know, my daughters will kill me if I don't get one picture of you. He said, John, you could have been taking as many pictures as you want. 
And I said, oh, <laughs> that kind of reaction. But anyway, he said, well, let's take it in the backyard. He said, no, wait, don't, don't, don't get anywhere. Let me go out and see where the lighting is the best. You know, he went out like a director, you know, setting up the scene. And he took this. Well, this is the girl, Rosalind, who wrote the screenplay. And she and Mel, at that time, Lars was two years old. That's their son. Now, at that time, Rosalind was 29 years old, and Gibson wasn't. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but I got my picture, and the girls were really happy. All right, now I'll end it with a little lesson. I do this with every talk I give, pretty much. <clears throat> This is from a different book. Hattie Hobbs from Kokomo, her son, Billy Hobbs. He was one of the last four Americans to die in combat in World War II. The last four. And that's the book here, Dogfight Over Tokyo. Copies of which are available over there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but she, on the anniversary of his death, he was killed, you know, the last day of the war, she wrote a poem and sent it to the Kokomo newspaper every year until she died. And one of them said in the poem, none know the depths of our deep regret, but we remember when others forget, you know, they forget all about Billy. We will remember, but others will forget. Oops, excuse me. Father Powers, who was a chaplain. This, this book, Soldiers of a Different Cloth, is over there. That's the story of chaplains in World War II. Um, they're from Notre Dame, so if you hate Notre Dame, then you may not want to listen for a minute. <laughs> At the, uh, but I wrote the book not as a Notre Dame book. I wrote it as a chaplain book. This could have happened to any chaplains. And he wrote after the, right after the war, he visited a cemetery with the American dead. I've found endless rows of white crosses in perfect diagonals, marking a design for eternity. Their valor is enveloped forever in silence, perhaps all too soon forgotten, except by some obscure gold star mother somewhere far away. A gold star mother was the mother of someone who died in combat. Okay. So his theme of forgetting. Well, how can we make sure we don't forget the veterans in this audience and the veterans from any era in our military history? I deal with World War II, so I focus on that here. But the same could be true for anything, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, you name it, okay? Take a lesson from those veterans. I'll let Stan Bowen talk, because <clears throat> the Laffey guys are gone. Stan Bowen was a corpsman. A corpsman went in and took care of the wounded in battle. So he went into combat without a weapon. His job was to fix up those who were wounded. Tarawa, that book's over there too, somewhere one square mile of hell. Um, <clears throat> he spent three days treating wounded and dying at a place called Tarawa. If you saw the beginning battle scene to saving Private Ryan, imagine that for three days. That's what they were involved in on Tarawa. Tarawa was two miles long and 800 yards wide at its widest. So there was no real back area to go to. You were at the front almost everywhere. <clears throat> he was there without a weapon. He obviously survived. That's him in California. He spent three days. At one time in the battle, he saw some wounded Marines taking shelter behind an AM track. This is a picture of a damaged AM track, amphibious tractor, AM track. It can go in the water, and then when it gets to land, it goes on, like, has, has like a tank tread kind of a thing. It goes on land. Well, they were huddled behind. There were four of them. And he knew they're not going to get out of there alive. So he ran from the beach. He got two of the wounded Marines, one under each arm and dragged him to shore, all under heavy fire. So a lot of guys died in the water at Tarawa. And then he went back and got the other two and did the same, brought them to safety, excuse me, under fire. <clears throat> then he gets to the beach. 
he's trying to mend the men, the Marines on the beach. And he came across one young Marine, and he said, John, he couldn't have been even 17, certainly not 18 years old. And I took one look at him, and I saw, I can't do anything for he's too badly wounded. And he looked up at me, and he said, don't go. I don't want to die alone. And Stan's telling me this, and he said, John, there was a wounded Marine five yards to the right that I could save if I could get to him, and another seven yards over there that I could save if I could get to him. And this young kid is saying, don't go. And Stan is telling me this 60 years after it happens, he's crying like a baby. And he said, John, I had to let him go and die alone. And he did. Well, I ask Stan the question I ask of every military that I interview, you a hero? Nope. And he answers the same way all of them would answer. I'm no hero, I did what anybody else would do. That was my job. And then he said the words I hear so often from military veterans. And I bet those of you who are here today would say the same. I did what I was supposed to do. And he shrugged his shoulders like, no, no big deal. I just did what I was supposed to do. That haunted me a little bit. I said, is that true that he thinks he's not a hero? He was just doing what he was supposed to do. And I thought, what if we all did what we were supposed to do? Just what we're supposed to do. And I use education because I was in teaching for 30 years. What if every teacher taught the way he or she was supposed to do? That's all. You don't have to be teacher of the year. Just do what you're supposed to do. Now, I had the great pleasure of working with spectacular teachers in my 30 years and the pain of watching others who shouldn't be in the classroom and probably all of you have some of each what if every administrator in schools just did what they're supposed to do that's all nothing more what if every student studied just the way they're supposed to do yep just so, you know, they don't have to be the A-plus student, you know, just study what they're supposed to do. And what if every parent parented just the way they're supposed to? Wow. Sure would be a better world, I suppose, huh? And they're just saying, eh, we did what we're supposed to. That's no big deal. Forget about that. Nope, I don't think so. In World War II, Eleanor Roosevelt, I was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's wife, often visited servicemen. Four, her four sons were in action, and I don't mean behind the scenes. One was a Special Forces Marine. They saw some heavy stuff. And she had, she had visit troops all over, never in obviously a combat situation, but she would go visit them. And she had a prayer in her purse, and she said it every day. And she said, Dear Lord, lest I continue my complacent way, Help me to remember. Somewhere out there, a man died for me today. Now, today I would update a man or a woman, you know, but in World War II, a man died for me today. As long as there be war, I then must ask and answer. Am I worth dying for? Am I worth dying for? Did I do what I'm supposed to do? It's the same main theme as a powerful movie, Saving Private Ryan. <clears throat> you know, at the end, and these are pictures of the four, one group of the four original Private Ryans kind of thing. The Nyland family of Buffalo, that was sort of their story along with some others uh, added in. Anyway, if you, if you saw it, you remember the scene at the end when Captain Miller, played by Tom Hanks, is propped up on the stone wall and he's dying. His platoon was sent out to retrieve Private Ryan because his three other brothers, two in Europe and one in the Pacific, were killed. And they didn't want Mrs. Ryan to lose all four. So their job was, go get them and let's send them home. And they, did, they fought that battle at the bridge, and Tom Hanks, or Captain Miller is dying, he's at the wall. And he beckons Private Ryan, played by Matt Damon, uh, to walk over, and he does. And Captain Miller 
sort of tries to lift himself up and, and say as loud as he could, but it was really a whisper. He said, earn this. Earn it. In other words, he's telling Matt Dave Private Ryan, we have just died to save you, Private Ryan. Go home and earn this gift. Earn it. Be a good man. Excuse me, be a good man, be a good person. Do what you're supposed to do. And my favorite scene actually comes right after this when the elderly Private Ryan is at the Normandy Cemetery and his family is with him, grandkids included, and he's looking for Captain Miller's plot. He comes across it and the family stays back to let him have his thoughts for a little bit. He's looking down at the engraved Captain John Miller, blah, blah, blah. He says, I tried to do to remember what you told me that day on the bridge. I tried to be a good man. And then Private Ryan's wife comes over and he looks at her and it was such longing in his eyes. He says, tell me, I've been a good man. She goes, yeah, yeah, you've been a good man. Well, if we all do what we're supposed to do, we'll remember all the veterans, including the sacrifices by the veterans sitting here tonight It'll be a much better world, and this little boy in Arlington National Cemetery will have something to look forward to as well. Fifteen years later, that little boy, <laughs> my grandson Matthew, he's in his final year at the Air Force Academy. He's going into the Space Force after he graduates in June. Well, he's getting married <laughs> and then into the Space Force. And so he is having a happy life because of the sacrifices of all the people. Now, I'm big on tradition and on heritage and all that stuff, and I always let some close buddies of mine from childhood in Akron, Ohio, have the final three words. That's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Used to watch them all the time. <laughs> anyway. That is the reason why maybe Mel Gibson chose Hell from the Heavens or whatever. It's a heck of a story, that's for sure. Uh, it gets me every time when I'm talking about it, although I would probably say the same if I'm talking about one of the other books, too. I, I've been so blessed to do this. And um, I'll be happy to answer any questions, if there are any. And I certainly will be here to inscribe any books you want. $30 for hardbound, $20 for paperback. Um, uh, uh, buy as many as you want. And there are bookmarks, etc., for those who didn't get any, if you want. Yes, sir. How many what? Approximately how many people were you able to interview? Okay, I wrote this book from 2013 to 2015. And I interviewed 24 members who were still alive. There were three or four others, but I couldn't find them. The Laffey organization in Patriots Point is very active. And they had a roster. Um, and even they can't find those final three or four. But I did talk to the others, and they were a huge help. Most of them were still um, you know, proud of what they did. Uh, who are happy to help out, that kind of thing. Okay. That's one of the most fun parts of my job is interviewing veterans. Sadly, that's not going to be around much longer for World War II. But you just see how down to earth most of them are, not all of them actually, and how humble. You know, I'm not a hero. And it's funny, I. I would interview the families, too. You know, has he told you about stuff? No. And so I'd ask him, well, why haven't you told him? I said, well, they never ask me questions, so I assume they don't want to know. So when I tell them, well, you know, why didn't you ask him questions, they assumed he didn't want to talk about it. But he, he really would have been willing. Um, but that movie, Private Ryan, was the one that cracked the ice for a lot of veterans. Not because their sons or daughters asked grandkids. Grandpa, weren't you in World War II like that? You know, I'm, I'm pointing like Private Ryan's up there still. <laughs> the, um, 
And so they'd start talking, would you come to my schoolroom? And boy, did the guys love that. They th one said to me, they think I'm something special. You know, that's cool. So that cracked the ice for a lot of them. But, um, so it's been fun. <clears throat> I'm just starting on another one after this, but I'll be busy talking about that Eddie Rickenbacker book, which really, it, it surprised me in that one how an element of faith came out. I mean, I'm religious in my own way, I suppose. I'm a Catholic. I went to the seminary. Eddie Rickenbacker was not really religious. Among the eight, there was an agnostic. That's a person who says, I neither believe nor disbelieve. Prove it to me and I'll start believing. And one atheist who thought religion is hogwash. Well, turn out, and I had no idea this was going to be part of the story until I started digging into it. <clears throat> one of the eight who survived, he loved photography. He had a real expensive camera as the plane was land, going into ditch in the ocean. We got a light in the plane weight. I got my expensive camera, and I've got a copy of the New Testament that my church back home gave me for good keeping. Which do I keep? Which do I toss out? He threw away the camera even though it was major expensive. And after the war, he did become a photographer. Well, in their third or fourth day, he took out that New Testament and started reading it. And then the others started joining in. And then some stuff happened that was just unbelievable. Whether you attribute it to God or whatever, it was unreal. And even that atheist said, I have no choice now, I have to believe. This stuff can't be explained in any other way. And after the war, he went around the country giving speeches to church groups and stuff like that. So that one was a, a little bit of a different book, it turned out. It, it wasn't a battle book, except battling the sharks and battling the sun and battling the cold at night and battling no food and no fresh water. So it was a battle way beyond, maybe. But um, anyway, that'll be the one I'll be talking about next. All right, if there are no more questions. Yes, sir. The women? I haven't written about that. Most of my books will include family because it's a, it's a big deal for me that when a, a, a man went to war in World War II, his family went with him mentally. That's why in that book, you remember Mrs. Hobbs? Her son died in the last day of the war. I made sure to build her up. And the other one here, Mrs. Mandeberg lived in Detroit. The Mandeberg family was from Detroit. And so, it, yeah, family is a big deal that way. I've not done anything on nurses or hospital ships or anything like that. The Chaplin book has some of that because uh, I include two nuns who are prisoners of the Japanese. And they acted as nurse, confidant, priest, you name it. They were a little bit of everything. But otherwise, no, it's, it's the family. That's the human connection. You know, a documentary is great, but, but if it's not personal to you, it doesn't really hit home like it really could. So, anyway. Yes, sir? How do you pick your subject that you want to write about? Yeah, good question. Uh, mainly it's, all right, what's interesting out there that grabs me? Um, every once in a while, an editor will, like, or, I don't have any copies left of a biography of Eisenhower. They're slim, by half the size of those books. But they were for a series edited by Wesley Clark, General Wesley Clark. They contacted me and asked to do that. But generally, it's, I'm just looking around. Like Eddie Rickenbacker, I, I have a big book collection at home of, uh, I've just collected through the years. And one whole bookshelf is of books about World War II that were written during World War II. Really cool. You get a different perspective. Well, one of them was a little, a very slender volume that Eddie Rickenbacker wrote about this ordeal on the ocean. And I looked at it and I said, you know, if no one else has done anything on it, that would make a good idea. No one else had done anything on it. 
I contacted my agent, Jim Hornfisher, and he said, I've never heard of that story, John. We contacted the publisher, and he said, I didn't never heard of that story. <laughs> so that's how I picked that one. Tarawa was a book I just always wanted to do. Uh, that my first ma uh, national magazine article was on the Battle of Tarawa. I thought I'd love to do a book on it one day. And so uh, I, that's how I got that one. Um, you know, different ways. But you just sort of look around, and when something grabs me, because if I'm going to spend two years on it, it's got to grab me. Um, then I, I get to it. And the worst part of it is I have to write a proposal to convince the publisher to publish it. And I hate doing those, but you have to <laughs> for most of them. Because um, I haven't done all the research, and I'm trying to tell them what I liked about the book and why I should make money for them. Um, but anyway, uh, so two years, um, just choosing something that interests me. Okay. Okay, thank you much. I'll be here in case you want any books. I appreciate a wonderful audience. <laughs>